Present mode. Come on. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> There we go. Aha. You see that okay? You all see that? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Cool. Here. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so, oh, okay. Just clicking up. Um, so when I started putting this together, um, I decided how broad I was going to make it, how specific things like that. Um, but really the, the question is why study the military role of the horse? Like what's the, what's the point? Why, why that specifically? Um, the, the relationship we have with these animals goes back, to, you know, it's, it's baked into our culture basically. Um, it's hard to describe because of how removed a lot of modern people are from, you know, animals in general, but especially horses, they used to be such an everyday part of our lives. Um, but um, I don't know if, if everyone knows my background, but um, I went to school for, for history, but also um, the school I happen to go to um, is the same facility that the U.S. Equestrian Olympic team trains at. Um, so I rode there for four years, uh, literally lived on a farm afterwards. So I have uh, equine experience. And um, I think a lot of people don't realize just kind of the, the close relationship that one can have with an animal. It's almost like speaking with them. It's, it's more than like a dog or a cat or something like that. But um, to go back to way the beginning, <laughs> um, the, the partnership of horses with hum humans in war is almost as old as the concept of warfare itself. The first recorded uses of them in Eurasia was between 4,000 and 5,000 BC, and it was actually with chariots. Um, this is a depiction of a four-wheeled Sumerian chariot from about 2,500 BC, and uh, four animals are showing pulling it. I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but um, this little round bit right here, interestingly enough, that's a, a nose ring, and she went through their nose, and the reins would be connected to that. This was before the invention of the bridle, uh, so that, that's kind of cool. Uh, horseback riding, by comparison, uh, was not practiced in a military capacity until around 1500 BC. Uh, so quite literally, the cart was before the horse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I apologize. <laughs> okay, so at the beginning of the American Revolution, uh, there was an initial reluctance to adopt mounted forces. Uh, the general thinking at the time was that the primary use of the horse soldier was the charge, a tactic really dependent on the more open battlefields of Europe. Um, what would eventually be seen as a repeating pattern for the cavalry, their applied roles would change with the technology and doctrines of the day. Um, so thus far, I'm gonna to try to avoid using uh, that word <laughs> because uh, most of the, uh, for most of modern history, uh, the martial equestrians has two distinct roles, um, cavalry proper and the dragoon. Um, the cavalry traditionally were lightly equipped using uh, smaller, faster mounts and uh, dragoons, on the other hand, were more heavily armed and fought dismounted with, as a kind of like mobile infantry. Um, the slide shows a trooper of the four continental light dragoons. Um, his primary weapon is the saber, obviously, uh, but he also carries two pistols and a pommel holster. Uh, he also wears a large plumed helmet called a Tarleton helmet. Uh, it's a garment that, in addition to some kind of protection, uh, it also makes him look a bit bigger, so it's uh, the intimidation factor as well. Um, equestrian units traditionally were uh, quickly disbanded after major conflicts. So uh, because of the high cost of upkeep, they're very expensive. Um, it wasn't until 1833, uh, in the response to the Black Hawk War, that the first lasting mounted unit of the United States military was formed. Uh, it's appropriately called the First Regiment of Dragoons, and that's uh, this guy right here. Uh, the unit actually still exists today as the First Regiment of Cavalry. Um, the outbreak of the Civil War saw the next round of major changes. Um, the concept of separate roles for the cavalry and dragoons uh, was largely disappearing, uh, requiring units to assume any of these roles as the situation required. So I had to be more, more versatile in, uh, in their knowledge and uh, you know, training. Uh, also by this time, breech loading and even repeating firearms are becoming more practical. Uh, the difficulty of reloading a muzzle loader while on horseback really necessitated um, the cavalry having these more advanced weapons. It just wasn't possible as it was with the infantry. Uh, so they got that kind of stuff a lot sooner. Um, the diagram here, as you can familiar, you're probably familiar with it, the, the Spencer carbine, uh, seven shots, metallic cartridge, repeating action. Um, we have a 
noticeably modern firearm now being issued in the 1860s to the cavalry while the infantry were still using muzzle loading, you know, rifles. Um, that's 20 years before the invention of black powder. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, by the second half of the 19th century, the Indian Wars proved to be a conflict in mobility. It's perfectly suited for the cavalry, uh, but the branch began the 20th century with adolescents still to learn. Um, significant note was the 1866 formation of the 9th and 10th Cavalry Regiments. Uh, they're descending from the U.S. Uh, Civil War era. United States Colored Troops, uh, they're all African-American uh, units and uh, they have the distinction of serving to this day. And uh, they were the first units to be called Buffalo Soldiers. So the Bob Marley song was technically about them. Um, this slide depicts Sergeant John Harris of the 10th Cavalry circa 1868. Uh, he served in Texas and the Indian Territories. Um, you can see he carries both a carbine and a saber. Uh, the model of 1860 saber shown here uh, on our right side. Um, you'll, you'll see that pop up again later that, that still, uh, still exists. So um, now that we're up to the 20th century here, we'll talk about, a, talk about gear, it has to be done. Um, so uh, the kit you're gonna be seeing is like half cutting edge stuff and half not so much. Uh, this is the not so much. Um, the image on the left plate is from the 1917 Cavalry NCO's manual. It's the McClellan saddle. And on the right, you see an image from 1862 of the McClellan saddle. Um, it did not change a whole lot. Uh, there were minor alterations, but um, essentially the older ones were black and the newer ones were brown. Uh, that's really about it. Um, the core of the McClellan is it's a wooden tree. Um, it was covered in rawhide initially during the Civil War. By our time period, it was covered by leather. Um, the, the distinctive hole in the center right here, um, that's reduced weight, but also allowed the saddle to be more adaptable to a wider variety of horses. Uh, typically, you're going to have a saddle fit to a specific horse based on the shape of their back and other factors. Um, having the saddle shaped this way with this gap, that allowed a smaller number of sizes to fit a wider variety of horses. Um, I have an account from the, the Second Cavalry in France talk about having everything from draft horses to Spanish ponies. So um, they needed a versatile, versatile saddle. Um, the raised pommel uh, and cantle, so the front and the back of the saddle, uh, secure the rider on steep inclines and during drastic movement. Uh, this degree of support was necessary with older, more relaxed riding postures, um, what's called the military seat. Um, it was really just like if you see a Western rider today where they just kind of sit in their seats slumped with their heels forward. Um, it was necessary with that kind of seat, but uh, the more technical styles that are, that are taught later, which we now today consider uh, English riding. Um, that's, it was still of use when it comes to that. Um, gentleman you see on the right here, um, he's an uh, Italian uh, cavalry instructor who is uh, very implement, very uh, important in this sort of uh, more technical equitation that was started to happen in the early 20th century. Um, okay, so uh, we've covered the saddle. And now the other uh, traditional tool of the cavalryman uh, is carbine, or in this case, uh, his short rifle. Uh, up until this point in history, the U.S. tended to go their own way in terms of arms development. Um, you know, everyone's aware of you know this story as well. You know, most of Europe was exploiting, ex experimenting with you know smokeless powder, repeaters, things of that nature. And uh, you know, in the 1880s, 1890s, we were still fielding you know, single-shot black powder weapons for the most part. Um, Makes sense given the nature of the army at the time. It was a plains army. They needed um, you know, they needed to supply to worry about and to introduce a repeater. Uh, you really how are you going to supply these guys in the middle of nowhere? Um, by the turn of the century, uh, the army was ready to adopt a service rifle that embraced a lot of these key concepts that were happening in Europe. But um, the needs of the cavalry would actually play a major role in their development. Um, so going back a stage, uh, this is the last generation of service rifles before the First World War. Um, the Norwegian design, Craig Jorgensen, it was adopted in two configurations, uh, the long rifle and the carbine. Now, uh, the rifle was issued to most troops. The longer length, that would be more safely fired in ranks, uh, greater reach during bayonet fighting, greater accuracy, things of that nature. Uh, the carbine, on the other hand, was only issued to mounted troops. Um, the 
the bulk of a long rifle was unwieldy. They couldn't, you know, fire a long rifle from the saddle as easily. And um, uh, the stocks were also shortened, as you can see, I'm pointing with my hand. <laughs> uh, the stocks were short, as I can see, it reduced the weight. So less fatigue on the rider, less fatigue on the animal. Um, this was pretty common in, mo in many militaries up until the last say, quarter of the 19th century to have both a rifle and a carbine. But um, following the Boer Wars in South Africa, uh, the British found that infantry would appreciate the reduced weight of a shorter rifle, mounted forces would, reduce, would appreciate the reduced muzzle blast of a longer carbine. Uh, so they found about 24 to 25 inches was the ideal barrel length. Um, so hence the, the birth of the, the universal short rifle, or in our case, the the 1903 Springfield. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. We're First World War people. Um, but uh, just to go over the basics, uh, it's called the United States Rifle Caliber 30, model of 1903. Uh, it's called the Springfield, colloquially, despite that being only one of the major arsenals that built the thing. Uh, bolt action, five rounds, 30 caliber, uh, practical range of about 1,000 yards, but it was sighted out to about 2,850. Um, interestingly enough, those longer ranges uh, did come into use uh, with mounted forces of what's called volley fire. Uh, they would fire from extreme distances uh, by groups. And uh, a lot of Austrian cavalry talked about um, using volley fire from the saddle to basically use themselves as kind of a mobile artillery. Uh, they could rain bullets down from extreme distances, uh, not necessarily get exactly what they're shooting at. But uh, shooting in an area, they'd fire, you know, 30, 40 guys at a time doing like, you know, two, 3,000 yard firings. Um, let me see, where am I? Uh, it's basically a modified 1898 German Mauser. Everyone's again familiar with that. Um, they faced, we, we faced the 1893 pattern matters, Mausers in the Spanish American War. So um, we knew that was kind of the way of the future. Um, Fun fact about this guy, despite internet rumors to the contrary, uh, the or US Ordnance Department actually worked very amicably with the German Mauser company uh, during development of this guy. Um, they paid royalties in the amount of $200,000 in 1910 dollars um, to for the seven patents that the Springfield rifle and its clips used. So uh, it was not a stolen design or anything like that. We actually, we actually worked with them. This is prior to the First World War, obviously. So um, we could have that kind of relationship. Um, you can see a uh, regulation. The Troopers 1903 is carried on a three-quarter length of leather scabbard on the near side of the, of the saddle. Uh, from this view, you can also see the, the saddle bags here um, to the rear of the Trooper. Uh, on this side, we're keeping the items related to him. On the other side, we're keeping the items related to the horse. So it's mostly talking about on his side, you know, things that would be in an infantry haversack, you know, hygiene items, mess kit, things of that uh, nature. Whereas on the other side, for the horse's items, you're talking about, uh, you know, curry combs, brushes, uh, they would carry spare, um, spare horseshoes, one for the front, one for the back, things like that. This one. Uh, the trooper's secondary firearms, another, another familiar one. Uh, it's the model of 1911 automatic pistol. Uh, fire seven shots, 45 caliber ammunition from a detachable box magazine. Uh, it served the US military until 1985. It remains in a specialized use today. Uh, as such, there's very little to be said about it that you guys don't already know, but um, there's an interesting uh, cavalry role in its development. So I, I just wanna talk about that for a little bit. And um, I preloaded this because this is gonna get super nerdy. Um, here's a trooper with a big kitty cat. He's a kitty cat. He's cute. <laughs> Everyone enjoy the kitty cat. I actually wrote, uh, behold the big pit kitty cat on my notes. Um, so the, the first prototypes of what would become the 1911 uh, were sent completely unsolicited by John Browning uh, to the US Ordnance Department in 1898. Um, they were, so the prototype was refined. Um, many subsequent versions. Um, at that point, the semi-automatic designs of the time would lock closed on the last shot. Um, you would also have to use your non-dominant hand to eject the magazine. There was a heel release down here. Um, it was very much a two-handed operation. Um, so a formal trial started in 1907 and included tests for endurance, accuracy, and handling. And pretty much all of the requirements for the trial were directly related to mounted use of the pistol. Um, they weren't trying this by infantry or anyone else yet. It was exclusively the cavalry. Um, some of these requirements include the ability to safely reholster a loaded weapon. So um, 
any of you guys familiar with 1911s, um, back here, it's uh, around part uh, 35. This is the grip safety. Uh, basically, when you're holding it, it's engaged. When you're not holding it, it's disengaged. Uh, so it allows you to just drop the, the weapon right into the holster, and it's, gonna, it's not going to fire when you don't want it to. Um, under normal circumstances at this time, it wasn't really considered a safety problem to carry um, a weapon with a hammer down and no manual safety engaged at all. And that's really because um, if dropped from pocket height or holster height from a standing human, uh, there really wouldn't be enough force generated to detonate a cartridge generally. Um, but because with the cavalry now talking about the weapon being dropped from a horse height, um, that does become a problem. So things like this grip safety um, were um, directly for them. Um, and Cole solved the issue with the grip safety. Uh, Okay. Okay, they also included the ability to decock uh, the gun with uh, one hand. So um, if the hammer is pulled back and the grip safety is disengaged, then the hammer will then uh, fall entirely, but not detonate a cartridge. So you can decock the thing with one hand. That was also a, a request of the cavalry. Um, so, and also in the last shot hold open, everyone's familiar with uh, modern semi-automatic pistols. When the last shot is fired, the slide locks back. Well, that wasn't necessarily the standard at the time, and it was again done, so um, minimizes the amount of manipulation a trooper would need to do when uh, they're reloading their weapon. So they would just pop a magazine in, disengage the, the slide lock, the magazine would come forward, and then strip the new round. So it's a, it's a one-fingered operation. And the same thing with the, the magazine release as well, uh, part 48 here. Um, we're familiar with magazine releases being here, uh, you know, again, in modern designs, but uh, they were at the heel prior to this. So operate with the thumb, again, more one-handed operation. Uh, and then also a lanyard loop here, again, part down here. Um, so it could be tied to a lanyard attached to the trooper. If you drop it, it doesn't, it's not completely lost. Um, at the end of the test, um, the two best candidates were selected and supplied enough to your troop equip three troops of cavalry for a year. Um, 65 each went to the 10th Cavalry in the Philippines, the 4th Cavalry in Minnesota, and the 2nd Cavalry in Iowa. Uh, at the end of the year, uh, the reports came back um, and they were shockingly bad. Um, the results of which, um, I know you guys probably know Ian Ferguson from Forgotten Weapons. Um, he said there was, it was the result of revolver-loving Luddites. Um, <laughs> uh, two troopers managed to hurt themselves um, using it. Uh, one managed to fire the pistol partially disassembled. Um, and as a result, the slide flew off and hit him in the face. Um, another one managed to injure themselves by holding the pistol by the slide while firing it over the hammer. Uh, it's hard to describe, so I have this very uh, technical demonstration here. Um, the banana was not loaded, in case anyone's wondering. Um, we have a quote from uh, Lieutenant Burnett, Troop H, 4th Cavalry. Uh, the enlisted men do not seem to like it. The nearly 50% of the men in the troop have fired Colt's revolver caliber 38. And without exception, these men prefer the pit, that pistol to the automatic. I believe that a pistol charge with the automatic pistol would be brought with extreme danger to those making the charge as much as that with the enemy. Uh, as a weapon for the officers and an intelligent, well-instructed enlisted men, this automatic pistol would be a valuable weapon, but its adoption for the use of the average enlisted men and for the great mass of ignorant recruits in a time of war, in my opinion, would be most unwise. Um, despite these warnings, trials would continue in the 1910 trials. Um, they had requested the, uh, that another manual safety. So if anyone ever wonders why a 1911 has two safeties to this day, it comes from those 1910 cavalry trials. So another kind of way that uh, a lasting thing was influenced. Um, okay, uh, two more plates from the 1917 NCO manual uh, show us the remainder of the trooper's equipment, including a bedroll, nose bag, spare clothing. Um, a particular note, uh, when this was published, um, the cup was not the night model 1910 cup. You guys are all used to seeing that nest in the canteen. Uh, this is the older model, uh, sometimes referred to a 1906 or 1908 pattern. 
uh, they carried their cup outside of their saddle hanging from the strap of the canteen. So it wasn't really necessary for them to have a very compact one. Uh, and the layout of the trooper's weapons over here, you can see um, obviously his rifle. You also can see a saber, and this is the pattern of 1913 saber. So I'm going to talk about that a bit. Um, it's 44 inches in overall length, a 35 inch blade, and it had a weight of roughly two and a half pounds. Uh, it had a basket shaped hilt, as you see right here. Uh, it's good protection for the hand of the user. And uh, because of its size, it was actually carried attached to the saddle as opposed to attached to the trooper, uh, which had been the practice with previous, uh, previous sabers. Uh, the weapon was designed and the drill manual written by a then Lieutenant George S. Patton. Uh, for this reason, it's referred to as the Patton saber today. Um, after studying saber combat in France in 1912, um, Patton referred to the, returned to the United States and served as an instructor at the Mounted Service School in Fort Riley, Kansas, where his title was Master of the Sword, which is pretty cool. Um, his first steps of the training regimen would be the dismounted practice of guards and attacks, as shown here. Um, then they would practice mounted. There's a lot of illustrations in the manual that look really goofy because they're doing this standing and all bow-legged and stuff. Um, these are illustrations from that 1914 manual, and you can kind of see how they were intended to attack with the, uh, with the saber. My favorite one has got to be a lunge to the right rear. That's pretty cool. Um, so let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, being straight and slender, the intention was to attack with the point as opposed to, as Patton put it, slashing wildly like a caveman. Um, later parts of, tra of uh, training would include practicing the charge using dummies and a uh, countering attack using of single and multiple instructors. So they, they would actually train um, fighting multiple opponents with their saber, which is pretty interesting. Um, Prior to its redesign, you do see these as well. This is the older model of Saber. Uh, it's looking very familiar to those earlier pictures I showed. Um, the pattern was originally the model of 1860. This is technically the model of uh, 1906. The only difference being the hilt is iron instead of brass. That's, that's it. They'd fit in each other's scabbards and everything. You'd sometimes see a surplus Civil War blades being remounted to the, the 1906 pattern. Um, and here's an image of the 10th Cavalry from the Punitive Expedition, um, probably from 1917 or so. And uh, you can, if you look really closely, you can actually see the, the curved older model uh, sabers on their saddles. So that's kind of cool. They're a regular army unit, but they had the old stuff. Um, okay, I just want to go briefly into the Cavalry's actual service during the war. Um, there's a lot to be said about this, but I'm just going to try to keep it, keep it quick. Um, uh, troops of the cavalry were sent to France with the American Expeditionary Force. Uh, they were often called upon to perform a wide variety of tasks um, that they weren't exactly trained for initially. Uh, the frequent role was military police. And uh, here you can see two troopers from the 3rd Cavalry that are uh, outfitted to do that. Um, what's interesting here, you can see it has the model 1916 holster. That's the holster we think of. That's the one that uh, continued to serve into World War II um, and up until the 1980s, that was just a, a black leather color. So anyone who's served in the last you know, 75 years probably saw one of these things. Um, normally we think of a, a different type than model 1912 holster as being associated with cavalry that rode a bit lower, uh, but they really weren't issued in that way. One pattern just kind of replaced the other. Um, so uh, cavalry were not the only mounted soldiers in France. Uh, horses and mules were used as transport in many places where uh, trucks and automobiles uh, the time couldn't go. And uh, they used to pull all manner of things, artillery pieces, supply wagons, things like that. Um, many period photos also depict officers of any number of job descriptions uh, riding horses. And uh, this actually became a problem at one point when cavalry units faced the occasional shortage of mounts or having unserviceable mounts because the good ones were field requisitioned by officers. So officers would just come and uh, they knew the cavalry had the, the better horses. They thought the cavalry had the better horses. We'll kind of see a bit about that later. Um, the regiment that actually did uh, conduct combat operations in France was the second cavalry. Um, in Europe, the, or, um, the regiment was organized in three squadrons and a regimental headquarters. Uh, first squadron was troops A, B, C, D, and E. 
uh, F, G, H, I, and K and L troops were second squadron. And a third squadron was headquarters, supply, and machine guns. Um, infantry company was uh, six officers and 250 men, whereas a cavalry troop was five officers, 105 men, 260 horses. So three mounts per trooper. Um, only 80 men of that was the actual fighting strength. Uh, the first sergeant, two cooks, two buglers, and 25 horse holders were not factored in. Uh, the majority left of the second left Hoboken, New Jersey on March 22nd, 1918. I wanna go back. This actually isn't the second cavalry. This is, uh, this is an image from the Bronx in uh, Van Cortlandt Park, but uh, this is the New York uh, National Guard, the first cavalry of New York. They later became the 106th Machine Gun Company. So I uh, just thought this picture was cool. Uh, getting back. Uh, for logistical reasons, uh, the second was not permitted transport space with their horses on shipping over, so they were expected to uh, get their own man mounts in France. Um, they arrived in Bordeaux on April 6th. Um, the first 67 Americans who arrived in France on uh, June, arrived on June 13th, 1917, uh, 30, of those uh, 67, 35 were cavalrymen, and uh, 31 were members of the 2nd Cavalry Regiment. Um, one officer and 20 troopers was permanently detached uh, from 1st Squadron to serve as General John Pershing's uh, security detachment at ADF headquarters, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, the remainder of 1st Squadron was assigned to work with remount stations initially, and that's a topic Brian's going to get into. Um, uh, during the Marne campaign, uh, A and C troops went to first the 1st Army to conduct escort duty for prisoners of war. Uh, reconnaissance patrols and uh, military police duties. Uh, they continued to perform these types of missions for First Army, uh, moving generally closer to the front as they operated. Um, the regiment sustained its first casualties when A and C troop commanders were wounded by, by shrapnel fire while conducting a patrol on August 1st of uh, 18. Uh, in the first week of that year, again, August, uh, Troop I was attached to the 10th French Cavalry. Uh, they conducted uh, dismounted patrols mostly, uh, locating and identifying German strong points, things like that. In, uh, in the two weeks that they did that, 16 men from Troop I had been killed, uh, seven from gas. Um, it's here. Um, on August 30th, 2nd uh, Cavalry was di directed to form a provisional mounted squadron near Neufchâtel. Uh, their horses were all recovered battle veterans for, were obtained from remount stations. So they said a lot of them had bullet wounds, who were, had been through gas attacks, things like that. So the officers that were coming to the Cavalry for the best horses weren't necessarily coming to the best place, um, at least with this particular provisional troop that was set up. Um, on the 12th, uh, the cavalrymen were ordered to proceed through open territory to Hue de Court. And I'm going to butcher these French pronunciations, I apologize. Um, five miles from the front lines, they encountered a German troop column uh, preparing withdrawal to the east. Um, so they, they, they did attack it. Um, one portion of the troop established covering fire with Browning automatic rifles. The remaining troop charged the column head on. Uh, the, American unit was only driven off when the Germans got their machine guns into action. So this was an armed cavalry charge against German forces. So the myth of there were no cavalry in World War One, they, they did, they did things. <laughs> um, for the next three days, the troopers continued to pursue and harass the retreating Germans, ultimately taking 60 prisoners and uh, capturing 56 machine guns. Uh, the Americans only withdrew when ordered to do so. Uh, the second went on to participate in the Argonne Offensive, the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. Uh, 16 man detachment of Troop F managed to knock out two machine gun bunkers, capture a heavy artillery position, and take 16 additional German prisoners. Uh, the unit ultimately was moved from the front after losing 75% of its operational assets. So men, horses, uh, all through casualties of various means, not necessarily all killed, but out of action. Um, because of the specialized training these roles required, um, they couldn't get replacements to get the unit back in until after the armistice. So that basically ended the, the second's career, um, at least in combat during the actual war. Uh, do, 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 do. 
Um, so the lack of more extensive uh, combat for uh, U.S. cavalry and, and uh, mounted forces, not because of any of their fault, it was really just the theater they were operating in. Uh, the Western Front didn't provide many opportunities for cavalry to take advantage of their strengths. Um, the opportunities, however, did um, they did present themselves on the Eastern Front. So um, they had mostly open terrain. Um, there were 12 cavalry charges conducted in the West by all sides where the Americans and French were operating. Whereas in the East, the Russians alone co conducted over 400 cavalry charges. Um, so just as a last thing, this isn't an American thing, but I really like it. Um, this book called The End of Chivalry uh, it was written in the 1980s, and actually not written, but it was published in the 1980s, but it is a veterans accounts of the war, specifically Russian cavalry veterans. So it's kind of cool to hear like in their own words what, um, what this did. So I just want to read a little bit. Um, this takes place in um, 1915, September 29th. It's the Adaman Guards Cossack Regiment. Um, they encountered a moving uh, Austrian troop column. So actually very similar to the engagement I described with the American second cavalry. But um, just excuse me while I read here. Uh, the squadron mounted, sabers drawn immediately, almost by instinct, blades flashing in the afternoon sun. Uh, the captain now galloped to a squadron commander. Attack, he said, lead off right away. Mikloff, also young and enthusiastic, did not tarry. Spurring his horse, he dashed forward. He turned towards the next squadron. Mikloff's horse had not gotten more than a dozen strides when several machine gun bullets hit both of the captain's arms. Austrian fire was now sweeping the area. Uh, Mikloff dropped his reins. His sword fell from his hand and dangled by the sword knot from his broken wrist. The horse in full gallop and under no control veered at a right angle and ran across the squadron's front. Vigrin saw this. Wrenching the horse around his wrenching the horse around, he now galloped in front of the squadron. Fourth squadron, follow me. Hurrah, and they were off. The other squadron, taking their cue from the fourth, rushed forward. The Austrians were also emerging from one of the ravines from a short distance away. Seeing the charging squadrons, they attempted to form squares. The old formation that brings up visions of the Napoleonic Wars, Waterloo, and the infantry squares bristling with bayonets. The times had changed. In those different distant days, infantry marched and fought in close formation. It took uh, only instants to form squares. Now machine guns and repeating rifles, these deadly harvesters of men, called for deployed formations. To bring them into squares took time, and with horses thundering at them at 30 miles an hour, time ran out. The Russian lancers crashed into the Austrian lines, lances and sabers ripping and cutting through hapless foot soldiers. The second squadron on the left flank went through three lines of Austrians, reaching the deepest of the four ravines. Galloping down, they found a small bog at the bottom. On the other slope of the ravine, several machine guns blazed away at the oncoming cavalrymen. The boldest horses leaped the bog. The others tried to scramble through. Getting stuck in the process, the enemy machine guns mowed down horses and men. Of those attempted to cross in a leap were Trooper Karchenko. He kept on going, but by some miracle remained unscathed. Coming up to a machine gun, Karchenko thrust at the gunner. His lance entered the mouth and emerged from the gunner's neck. Sergeant Major Shiklov also galloped safely through the hail of bullets. He leaned from his saddle and slashed at another machine gunner. The blow had all the impetus of the rider's arm, plus 1,500 pounds of the galloping horse. The Austrian's head rolled right off his shoulders. Um, I have more, but you get the point. Um, but uh, that's what I have for you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, you have any questions or? Oop. Oop. Can I hear? Uh oh. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. I'm done. <laughs> Great job, man. Thank you. Oh, I just exit. Uh, boink. There we go. All right. Uh, Stop share. There we go. Exactly.
I was going to say, great book. Oh, <laughs> I think your copy's older than mine. <laughs> yeah, this this is um, they're not very expensive. Well worth the read. It's a pretty quick read, but it's it's you can get it relatively cheap on Amazon. Mm. Great Eastern Front book. I don't have that one. I may have to get that one. I've got uh, um, uh, what's his face, the Russian Russian Hussar book, which is also pretty good for that that Another stuff. Good book. Um, Spurs of Glory. Uh, story of the U.S. Cavalry. This is another, another good one. So, um, Brian, you ready to go? Yes, I am. Uh, I had a question. Brian, are you a doctor? Yes, I'm a veterinarian. Uh oh, I lost you. I get it. Yeah, I haven't done a very good job of introducing everybody, but let me um, spotlight you, and you can share your screen when you're ready. All right, hold on. I seem to have messed something up here. I've got myself up in the corner. Well, don't worry about yourself. Just go to share screen. You're now the, everyone's seeing you nice and big. Oh, there it is. All right, yeah, today I'm going to uh, expand on, on Paul's uh, talk um, a little bit. He's giving you a little bit of background on what the cavalry uh, was doing. Well, I'm going to talk about their mounts. Um, the horses, are, you know, you're not cavalry without a horse. Uh, so we'll start by talking about the Army Remount Service because that was the group that was put together to gather all these horses uh, for the mounted services, the cavalry and uh, the artillery in particular and uh, any, any other groups use horses. We, you know, even in the, uh, the early 20th century, as uh, uh, auto automobiles and, and trucks were becoming more common, there was still a tremendous amount of, uh, of horse-drawn uh, traffic. And the same, same was the case in, in Europe at the war, in the war. Uh, there was still, there was cavalry. Uh, most of the artillery was drugged by horses, uh, supply wagons, water wagons, um, ambulances, everything was carried by horses. So we needed a tremendous amount of horses to go overseas. Um, as, as was uh, mentioned, uh, because of uh, um, the space that was available on the ships, uh, it was difficult to get as many horses over there as we needed. Uh, so, I mean, the remount system devised, I mean, through the, through the British and the French, we all kind of combined to get, get the horses that were needed. Um, I'm going to show you some slides here. If I can get on here. Uh, yeah, here it is. All right. So the remount system um, was first. Well, let's let me back up. Um, Traditionally, the army sent out quartermasters to buy horses from private individuals and would gather horses together. And uh, a lot of it was done at, at a relatively small unit, um, uh, you know, time. The, you know, the reg regiments and, and brigades would, would be buying horses. Well, about 1910, they decided that we needed to get more organized and start breeding our own horses and start uh, you know, building better horses for our troops. Uh, so, um, hold on a second. Um, give me just a second. Sorry, kids. Um, anyhow, 1910, we decided to, to build remount depots. So we put, we put together, we had uh, four, three depots at that point um, in Front Royal and uh, Fort Reno, Oklahoma, and Fort Keogh, uh, Montana. And their, their job was to gather horses and to breed horses and to make enough horses for our, uh, our troops to use at that point. Um, as the, the war started in Europe, 
uh, the Euro Europeans were coming over here to uh, buy horses. And um, uh, where are my numbers? The, uh, the Europeans actually had bought 200,000 between November of 1914 and July of 1915. As we entered the war, uh, actually before we started entering the war, they, we started expanding. Uh, started another uh, uh, Remount Depot in Fort Robinson, Nebraska. And as the, the war went on, uh, we started to uh, um, establish more additional auxiliary depots and there eventually were 33. Um, as I said, there was an incredible, incredible amount of horses going overseas, and we used a lot of horses uh, over the course of the over the course of the war. Uh, we processed 571,000 horses and mules, and uh, of that, uh, we put into service 181,000, almost 182,000 horses and 61,000 mules. Um, the the AEF lost 68,000 horses in the course of the war. And over the course of, you know, it's a world war, throughout the world, there are probably 8 million horses that were lost. And uh, one of the things that we try to talk about when we do is this, this mounted living history is the, is, is the, the value of the horse. Um, I mean, they've, they've served, served us as uh, compatriots in war for centuries. And uh, we try, try to think about the numbers that serve. Um, so the remount depots uh, were, this is one of the only auxiliary remount, remount depots on Camp Lee, close to me down in P Petersburg. Uh, it's basically, they just have all these horses gathered and would be feeding and training. Um, uh, basically, when a horse was, was uh, bought, if it wasn't bred on the, on, on the place, uh, they would come in, they'd be inspected, and uh, this is the Remount Depot at Front Royal. It's one of the ones we actually do some work at. It's an older, older picture. And we've got uh, Pershing's two horses were retired there, Kidron and Jeff. Um, but as horses were entered, the first things they would be clipped and shaved. So this horse has, has mange. And one of the first things they would do is clip, clip the horse so they can treat it. Um, we were talking about clippers earlier. I don't want to get a pair of this, the, 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 uh, the cranked ones. Pretty cool. Um, then after they were clipped, they would, they would run them through a dip vat to kill the ticks and the mange mites. And uh, they, would, they would start them off there at this, this long vat full of, full of insecticides. And they would push the horse in and he'd splash in there and swim to the other end where they'd pull him out and scrub him down and, uh, and send him on his way. After, uh, um, after they were inspected, treated for any diseases, uh, clipped up, uh, the horses would, would go into a training program um, where they would they would learn learn to be cavalry horses and they'd have to, have to learn to be tied together and and uh, and to ride ride in formation different things. Um, uh, then they would be loaded onto ships like this and uh, and sent overseas. Um, and then when they arrived, they would be sent to uh, auxiliary remount depots. Uh, where they would be um, issued out to various troops. Um, as we were saying, there was really a lot, lot more horses and horse-mounted troops than you would imagine. Imagine in France. I mean, traditionally we've always, always said, well, there's no cavalry in, in France during World War One um, because of all sorts of very, various reasons. Well, there's actually a lot of cavalry and a lot of there were a lot of U.S.-mounted troops. We didn't have any, any huge formations aside from what the, the second put together. Uh, at the end of 1918, um, but there was a lot of cavalry. Each uh, each division had a headquarters troop of cavalry, which uh, they were they were organized in various ways. But they would generally have at least one platoon of mounted mounted cavalry used for various various things: scouting, police work, uh, messengers, that sort of thing. Um, and then, of course, you know, artillery is probably the main the main thing that uh, we had to supply horses for. But other draft uses for uh, for wagons and and uh, various things, um, so the, the troops would draw from the auxiliary remount depots. So 
Um, of course, you know, in the, in the course of in the course of everything that was going on, uh, these horses would get hurt or injured, uh, would get diseased, uh, just like with the human troops. Um, there's probably more horses died from disease than anything else and from overwork. Uh, so the veterinary corps uh, was needed. Now, the veterinary corps has, has, uh, was actually very, very new at that point. Um, early, I mean, veterinarians have been associated with, with mounted troops for probably as long as, as uh, we've had horses in the army. Uh, up until the beginning of the 20th century, uh, it was really pretty primitive. Most of the veterinary work was done by farriers. Uh, there were eventually, what the driving force to get veterinarians into the army was actually happened during the Spanish-American War and really had nothing to do with, uh, with horses. Um, uh, you may, may recall that they had a problem with bad, bad canned meat in, uh, and supplies in the Spanish-American War. Uh, so they started hiring veterinarians to, to inspect the meat and be sure that we got, got good, good food. Well, this led to bring in some contract veterinarians to work with, uh, with the troops. Um, at, that point, at, at that point, they had two contract vets per regiment and, uh, and we kind of went along like that. But then, you know, toward, toward the, uh, once again, as things, a, lot of, a lot of the army is being uh, reorganized around 1910. They started thinking about developing a veterinary corps. Well, finally, in uh, the third, in June of 1916, uh, they established the veterinary corps, and uh, the idea was to train veterinarians and uh, and actually put together a veterinary operation that can take care of horses. Um, now, from uh, September 1917 to uh, uh, August 1918. Uh, they actually, the, where, whereas they had established the veterinary corps and made it part of the medical corps, uh, they took it away from the med medical corps and gave it back to the quartermaster corps where the veterinarians had always been associated before with the remount folks. And uh, that lasted until August 1918 when it went back to the medical corps and these things were really, really getting hot for our troops um, in the AEF. Uh, Uh, veterinarians were, uh, so what they did is they, they uh, established in the states training, uh, training facilities. Uh, the officers were trained at Fort Riley. The enlisted men were trained at Camp Greenleaf in Georgia. And then uh, Camp Lee at, in uh, Petersburg, Virginia, is where they basically had their advanced training. Uh, and they started putting, putting together all the veterinary hospitals. Um, the idea was that they, they organized it uh, they would have major veterinary hospitals in the rear and then there's supposed to be were supposed to be core mobile veterinary uh, units that would their their job was really just to triage and treat minor injuries horses that can be treated and put back into service within a couple days um, other horses would be sent back to the veterinary hospitals in the rear uh, there was also there are also army mobile uh, veterinary units uh, and they were supposed to be used as semi-permanent hospital closer to the battle area uh, and there would be veterinary field units that would be in charge of uh, gathering and triaging horses from the battlefield to send back. Now in practice it didn't really work this way. Um, unfortunately, you know, it, we had a, a new concept that uh, wasn't fully incorporated in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, in, 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 in the uh, wartime uh, and we had a lot of bureaucracy and problems getting it together. Uh, there were a lot of, uh, of uh, commanders that didn't know how to use the veterinary veterinaries at their, dis at their disposal. Um, I know in the in the like in the in the Meuse Argonne, they found that a lot of these uh, army mobile units that were supposed to be closer up to the battle, they were they were pushing them like way back, 60 kilometers behind the battle where they really were of much use and it was resulting in animal loss of animals because they weren't able to get them back to be treated um uh, there were there were people that were they were setting up uh, gathering areas in places where there weren't enough water 
and we lost a lot of a lot of horses. And um, I think the after action review was not very favorable of the veterinary service and the way they're being used. So it wasn't really until the very end of the war when they started to figure out um, how to use these guys. Um, a few more things I wanted to show you here. Uh, this is a picture. It's a British British unit, but most of our procedures we kind of adopted from the British. But these guys would be, this is, would be an example of like the vet field units who would uh, gather horses and do first aid, uh, do triage. Some horses were not able to be salvaged, but others they would, uh, they would gather up and send back. Um, and they could, you know, they had various types of veterinary ambulances uh, that they could uh, carry these horses in. Uh, a lot of them horse-drawn, um, some of them motorized. This is an example of, of one of the uh, uh, more common ambulances. Uh, talk about some of the some of the uh, procedures that were done at the veterinary hospitals. Uh, I don't know how many people you all have associated with horses, but one of the common things you have to do with horses, you have to file their teeth so that they can they can chew more efficiently. Uh, and so these guys, a bunch of New Zealand guys, are are floating this this horse's teeth. Um, one of the the biggest disease problems that we had. Well, in the world at that time, and certainly in the military, was glanders. Glanders is a is a disease um, caused by a type of bacteria that causes a severe respiratory disease. Um, there's a similar disease called farsi, which is more of a chronic disease. It gets in gets in underneath the skin, and um, basically it becomes a fatal fatal disease. And uh, so they developed a test called the Malling test which they could to figure out if these horses were carrying this disease and call them. Uh, the test involved in injecting uh, some of, some of uh, the uh, deactivated uh, uh, vaccination into uh, the horse's eyelid. And basically if the thing blew up huge, then we knew the horse was positive and they would, they would get rid of it. So this veterinarian is injecting the malign substance into the, uh, the eyelid as is uh, this guy into this mule. Um, occasionally you would have to do surgery on animals. Uh, this was a time period where we didn't have a whole lot of, uh, of anesthetic. So basically they would just grab these animals, tie them up and throw them down and, uh, and hold them down. They did, did use some uh, uh, inhalant, um, agents, chloroform, um, but you have to use a lot. And so a lot of times that, that didn't really happen. So here this, this mule is getting about to be cast and you got all these guys attached to ropes and they were going to, they just throw him down on this pile of hay and sit on him so the veterinarian can do his work. I'm glad we have anesthetics now. Um, same thing here. They've tied this horse to the uh, surgery table. And uh, once they've attached him there, they flip the table up to uh, to work on him. And it's pretty much the way surgery tables still work at major hospitals now. Uh, this is one of the veterinary hospitals in the rear, and in particular, it's their their contagious horse ward, and they're busy watering all these horses. And you can see there were a lot of personnel, veterinary personnel, remap personnel. Uh, cavalry, cavalry guys that didn't have anything else to do. Um, they were, uh, Paul didn't mention it, but there was also in addition to the second, the third, the, uh, the 15th and the sixth cavalry uh, were there and performed pretty much mostly remount uh, work. There were a few times that some of those guys went out in the field or did some other things. Um, so that's the end of the slideshow. I thought what I'd do, I've got a lot of my, the equipment that I've collected uh, here, let me, get, let me get rid of get out of this. I'm going to see if I can't show you some of the toys that I've got. Now, the veterinary equipment um, before the war and during the war. Uh, veterinarians were, were equipped with a bunch of boxes to carry all their stuff in. And basically, uh, most of them look like this. There were four of this size 
and it was one of the bigger sides. Uh, the idea was that they were they were about the size of a of a uh, ammunition box and could be carried on a pack horse. Uh, and the veterinarians carried all of their drugs and equipment in that. And this is what would be used in the mobile the mobile veterinary hospitals and I guess the field units too. Uh, prior to that, uh, and still during the war, they had uh, something called a veterinary pannier, which is basically kind of a medium-sized box that pretty much carried everything you'd need to treat an animal for, uh, you know, 10 days out. Uh, and the idea was the pannier, it would be carried by units that didn't have a veterinarian assigned to them, and so that the the uh, the farriers and the stable sergeants would have something to treat animals that got sick. Um, what I've got here, uh, I do have a, a surgical set. Uh, I forget what this one's designated, but basically carries all the the kind of general things you can use. General surgery set. Uh, on this side, I've got a uh, colpotomy instrument. Uh, this is supposed to have a chain on the end of it. Basically, it would be used to remove tumors. Um, in school, we use an instrument like this actually to spay horses. Uh, basically, it, it, the, the chain is put around whatever you're going to cut, and then it's twisted up until the chain cuts off whatever it is you're cutting. Uh, here we have a, I hope you guys can see this. Here we have a, uh, uh, an emasculator um, used to clamp off the cords when you castrate a horse. Uh, We've got a speculum here. It can be used to uh, to look to look in the nostrils. Uh, got a tourniquet here. Um, these instruments are used to cut holes in sinuses and in the head and through in bones and. Uh, uh, different types of operations you do with horses. Uh, if you have the things you have to do to get into the sinuses, basically just drill a hole in their head. Uh, sometimes you have to remove, remove their uh, molars. You have to do that too. You drill a hole in the head and just bang the thing out with a hammer. Um, uh, in the center part, we've got lots of clamps and uh, various scissors and things. Uh, some scalpels and uh, various things over here. Um, this instrument is kind of fun. This is called a Seton needle. You see that? Look at that lined up. Um, the Seton needle goes way back to the Middle Ages. Uh, basically, and there was, it was still still used in this period. Uh, what you would do is you take this big needle and you would attach a piece of uh, gauze or or, or uh, uh, oakum or something to the end of it, something dipped in anesthetic. And you would you could pull that through an abscess wound, and uh, leave it there as a drain, and uh, um, and and to be honest, I actually do do that sometimes. We do that uh, with abscesses now, or we pack them pack them with different types of gauze. Um, other things we have here, this is a, uh, a portable hoof knife um, used to uh, to carve carve uh, into the the hoof. Uh, and the sole, looking for abscesses. This one has a number of different uh, uh, ends you can attach to it to uh, help you help you cut. Um, uh, this is kind of a fun thing here. Down here, we've got uh, this bottle. This is a dosing bottle. You would put liquid medicines in that. It's got a rubber end on it, and uh, then you can you can stick that in the horse's mouth and dose him with medicine. Uh, down here, I also have, uh, here's our uh, floats that we had talked, you know, we talked about filing horse's teeth. So uh, these are the floats that are used to grind down the teeth. Get there, get in there and, and file down their teeth. Uh, the things we've got, the uh, the inside of the boxes were meant to hold medicines, and uh, in here got various things: calcium carbonate, uh, ammonium chloride was used as an expectorant. 
In other words, to make it make it cough, make it to loosen up a cough. I think sulfate could be used as, as a, a drying agent for uh, uh, wounds or for uh, skin problems. Um, Mix up that's a, a powder that's used for uh, for scar tissue. Uh, here in front of the we're in the in the pannier. Uh, we've got bandaging materials. They used uh, cotton wraps. Um, got different types of gauze. Most of the gauze packaging hadn't been changed didn't change much from from war to war. Um, they used uh, Castile soap to uh, to clean things. Um, one of the one of the neat things that, that was out was Vaseline petroleum jelly was good to use for use as, as an ointment. Uh, I also packed wounds with uh, get that out of there. You have iodoform gauze, uh, basically gauze soaked in iodoform that you use for use for for packing wounds. Uh, Different types of ointments, antiseptic ointment there. And pine tar, pine tar is used used for a lot of the hoof problems. Uh, other goodies here we have uh, copper sulfate used once again. That was that, that moon powder I showed before. Had a lot of copper sulfate that used for for uh, uh, granulating wounds. Uh, Odoform powder, um, alcohol, olive oil. And somewhere I thought I had some ammonia. Uh, they would use uh, mix. You can mix together a uh, mix together some of those things to make it a liniment. Make liniments for um, hurt uh, muscles and, and liniments or ligaments. Uh, boric acid can be mix, mixed up to to clean out eyes. Uh, basically, um, the most common things that they would see in horses. Uh, certainly, in terms of disease, we talked about glanders. Uh, you worry about flu, equine influenza took uh, took a lot of animals out, uh, and then uh, you know, obvi obviously, uh, wounds from battle, shrapnel wounds. Uh, gas, of course, uh, affects the horses about the same way as it did did with humans. Uh, so you'd have uh, lung injuries uh, or uh, some skin skin injuries. Um, horses weren't affected quite as much in their eyes. As humans, uh, they've got a big third eyelid that will tend to cover up the eye when there's irritating stuff around. So that, that they didn't have quite as much trouble with that. Uh, colic, stomach ache, um, you would see commonly, uh, and would be treated with uh, various things. They actually used, uh, you know, as, as popular as, as CBD oil is now, they used it back then. Um, cannabis was mixed mixed with alcohol, and they would dose a colic for pain relief. Uh, they'd also use uh, um, uh, purgatives like aloe and uh, ammonia also would be used for that. Um, and that could be administered either through your dosing bottle or uh, through a stomach tube that would be run through the nose and down, down to the stomach. Um, I got my uh, casting rope here so that we can throw horses down if we have to. Uh, the other uh, thing we've got here, they used, uh, how many people are familiar with oakum? Oakum is uh, rope fibers that have been soaked in, uh, in oil and pine tar. Uh, traditionally, it's used to, to pack in between the cracks in ships' hulls to, uh, to waterproof them. But it was used. A lot of it was used as bandaging material, and used in in uh, treating diseases of the of the hooves to pack um, to pack pack the sole. So uh, they would carry oakum with them. Um, where are we? I'll show you uh, veterinarian saddle. Officer saddle here. That's a 1916 officer saddle. Um, I knocked off the top of my bag. But attached to the back, we've got a saddle bag. And this is actually this is these bad. This is actually a German bag, but it's exactly the same as what we use. We adapted adopted it from the Germans. 
and uh, this the veterinarian could carry uh, light bandaging materials and stuff. Basically, the bottom part you have uh, some cotton bandaging materials. Once again, the the oakum came packed in a package like that. In the top, there were there were compartments that would hold uh, the syringe. I can get this out of here. Then here have a, a syringe kit you can administer medicines with. And uh, usually there would need to, I, I, I have not managed to collect the bottles yet, but there would be bottles full of uh, um, pills that could be dissolved to be injected. And the other thing, move this over here, would be the, uh, the veterinarian's portable surgical kit. Should look like this. This one's a, a leather version. Um, they also had canvas versions. Uh, this one's got a lot of stuff in it. Um, scissors and uh, uh, various retractors. Um, this is the curved scalpel is called a beastry knife. Um, once again, we've got our little buddy, the Seton needle, um, and a couple of the different types of. Uh, scalpels here. And like most of my leather work, leather stuff, I think needs some oil. Well, I think that's the end of show and tell. Uh, I'm willing to entertain any questions. Was thrush a big problem? I know like trench foot was a problem with humans. So like was, was thrush equally as problematic with, with the horses or were they treating yeah. it like preventatively with oakum like you were talking about? Well, thrush and thrush and, and uh, various types of skin problems from being in all the mud. Yeah, there was a lot of that. Um, so there were always, you know, hoof problems. And, and that's why I found, they found, I mean, I was reading, reading accounts in various places where they were trying to gather these horses up and there was so much mud, they ended up, you know, in a lot of cases, they had to, had to improve the area by bringing in a lot of gravel. And, uh, um, you know, and they found that because they found the horses, the surfaces they were standing on were just contributing to more foot problems, more lameness. Especially since, you know, a lot of these horses were lame to begin with. And so, you know, it made it, made it more difficult They're standing around bad spots. Uh, uh Caroline had a bunch of good questions. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at some of those. Are there some tools that are still used from that era? Um, yeah, like I said, I mean, the, the, uh, the colpotomy um, troop, uh, instrument, uh, the emasculators, most of the, I mean, most of the, the, the clamps and the hemostats and stuff we use are similar to what was used then. Um, the, you know, still use stomach tubes. Uh, uh, I don't really use a seat and needle, but I do pack things with with, uh, with gauze often. Um, yeah, a lot of that stuff is still used. Basically, you know, a lot of things that have, a lot of the improvements have come along since. You know, obviously, we've we've improved uh, uh, sedatives and anesthetics, which are, which are really nice. And uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the other medicines, antibiotics and stuff, came along later. Um, we didn't, they didn't really have any of that then, other than we were still using, we we're just using sulfas at that point. It's about the only antiseptic or an antibiotic substance we had. Um, right. Were there, were there um, doughboys assigned to work with the veterinarians that had like just pulled them out of the ranks or had they, how, where'd they come from? Well, they were trained. They were trained veterinary technicians. The uh, like I said, in, in Camp Greenleaf, Georgia, was the biggest place uh, where they trained vet, you know, vet, vet corps troops. And then these guys would become part of the hospitals, and they'd be the ones that would they would be the bucket carriers for the veterinarians in a unit. And uh, and they were also, I mean, they had basically, you know, basically they were they would have uh, veterinarian veterinary technicians enlisted guys that would be out with the uh, the units the small units to gather up hurt horses 
So they were kind of kind of the 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 medics, the medics for horses, the the EMTs that would gather these guys up and bring them back to the uh, to the rear to be looked at by the veterinarian, and then they like once again they do triage and you know you put down what you can't fix and you send the rest of them back. Um, the amount of training a horse had like um, affect the amount of effort that they would put into trying to get back into service, you know, like horses that were trained for, for riding as opposed to just, you know, horses that pulled things or, or things like that, or it was just a, like kind of blanket across the board. Things were very, very specialized in, in terms of the remount system. They picked horses with various things. Uh, basically a cavalry horse would be horses that would be, you know, from about 950 to 1200 pounds. Uh, you have light draft horses that would be a little bit heavier from 1,200 to like 1,500 pounds. And then some of the heavy drafts, artillery horses, heavy artillery horses would be, you know, uh, 1,700 pounds okay. larger. Uh, but, you know, obviously, if there were times when horses got short, I mean, there were horses that had to do whatever they had to do. And uh, like we said, the... Um, uh, you know, the second started pulling horses to put together the provisional squadron. They, they grabbed all sorts of stuff. And they had draft horses and and light horses and you know whatever they could whatever they could get. Um, so yeah, there were you know because there were times when horses were not very available. And they would they would kind of show up show up you know from various places because the remount depots depots were active. We were like I said, we we're shipping horses from from the U.S. The British have had a big uh, remount system. They were training horses and sending over, and uh, there were there were places the French had too. With and, you know, and you were cap capturing horses as well. With so many horses lost, or or with horses that had to be put down, uh, what happened to them then? Were they processed or usually buried or burned? Okay, they would be great big pits and just push them in. So nothing was used for meat then? No. Well, I mean, they may have been a little, I mean, you know, not nothing formally. Okay. <laughs> wow. Brian, where do you practice? I'm in Virginia, in the Fredericksburg area of Virginia. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm in Williamsburg, so I, I knew you were in Virginia, but I wasn't sure yeah. where. <laughs> Yeah. Which um which types of events do you usually bring your kit and impression and your horses and like where could we come see you do this? Uh, oh, I don't, I don't know now, <laughs> <laughs> but we've been we've been we've been various places. I've been down to Petersburg a number of times. Uh, I've been down uh, your way to Norfolk um, at least once. We went down there to uh, the air show there in uh, in Newport News. Um, okay. But uh, we do a lot of work at that that Front Royal Dreamat Depot, uh, uh, and we've actually got something coming. We're going to try to put something together here later later uh, in the year for them. Uh, that, that's kind of a major a major focus for us. We really support them. Uh, but basically, anywhere where they'll let us drag horses, we go. We've been to Gettysburg. Uh, they've been pretty pretty receptive. Uh, it can be kind of difficult because you've got to have the right kind of facilities. You know, you have to have some place where you can put the horses and right. sometimes it's hard. Once again, it's hard because people are not, we're not a horse culture. It's hard to communicate to, uh, uh, you know, museum docents and, and uh, national park people exactly what we need for the horses. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Any other questions, anybody? Bob's got one. Hang on, hang on. You unmute. You're muted, Bob. Okay. But, I wonder um, if we acquired most of the horses um, in in Europe. I would assume then that we didn't bring any horses back. No, very few horses came back. They were sold sold off. Uh, usually, they had auctions at the end at the end of the war. There were some some private masks that were brought back, but for the most part, they were all sold off. Mm -hmm. Great. 
And then, um, well, like I said, we talk about the remount. I mean, the remount system lasted into the 50s because we had, you know, we had horse cavalry up right up into World War II. And they had, they had the, the U.S. Army had a big breeding program. And a lot of it, there's a lot of it happened right, right there at the, at the Front Royal Depot. And that's why we, we, you know, we're, we support them. And, uh, um, and a lot of those horses, I mean, it really, they really, really, uh, uh, here, in, here in Virginia, it had a big, big effect on the, uh, the fox hunting um, breeding programs and uh, the civilian riding programs. A lot of these horses ended up being sold off to civilians. And, uh, um, and like I said, and we had various types of mounted troops right on up into the 1950s when they finally sold off everything. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Paul. Um, I did want to uh, ask Sandy and Stephanie 